All right, we should be live now. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. I work at a, as a product manager at the Web Development Faculty at Practicum. Um, these webinars are brought to you by Practicum, which is an online bootcamp for everyone who wants to learn coding from zero. And uh, we're still waiting for some other people to join. So I'll just give you a short outline of this webinar. We'll have Lauren McCarthy's talk first, when we'll go into a short Q&A. And uh, after that, we'll just wrap it up. Um, it's a live stream, so if you experience any difficulties with sound or video, please don't hesitate to reach out in chat. Um, also, please uh, ask your questions in chat. We'll be adding them to Q&A. And uh, we are really excited to hear your questions and uh, thoughts on P5.js and creative coding. Um, as I've said, today we're having Lauren McCarthy. Really excited to host her. It was, uh, Lauren is an LA-based artist and an associate producer professor at uh, UCLA. She's also a creator of a popular JavaScript frame library, P5.js, which is one of our favorites here at Practicum. Uh, that's why we are super excited to have to listen to her talk. She, she is also an artist, and uh, today she'll be talking about building P5.js, her involvement in the open source community, and uh, working in the art and tech spaces. Uh, her current work is uh, focused on art, which examines social relationships at the age of surveillance and uh, automation. So we're really excited to hear, hear some stuff about that and maybe something about her future projects. Um, I think, uh, Lauren, you can go ahead and share your presentation. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to share with all of you. Um, so I'll share my screen in a minute. I just wanted to say hi. And um, Andrew gave that such a good introduction. There's not much more to say, but um, I'm going to, I really see my practices like kind of in two spaces at the same time. And one is um, built, you know, has been working on this P5.js framework and building the community and the tool. And then the other side is um, more art. So making art with code. Um, and I sort of see those things as separate, but coming together in different ways. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the art projects I've done. Um, and then maybe you'll see how some of those, the ideas and the things I'm thinking about kind of weave back into P5. Um, all right. All right. Andrew, do you see this okay? Yep, everything's great. Okay. Um, so I've often struggled with social interaction. I seem to feel like I have a harder time than most people kind of saying the things you're supposed to say. And so my practice is sort of this series of attempts to like hack my way out of myself, um, a way of understanding the social systems around me. One of the first things I made was this device, which would detect if I was smiling. If I stopped smiling, it would um, stab me in the back of the head until I started smiling again. Um, Andrew, are you hearing sound from my video too? Or no? No, no, not really. No, okay. Let me restart the sharing. Yes. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, share computer sound. I always forget that. All right, you should be good now. Um, you didn't miss too much, <laughs> just a cheesy song. Um, anyway, so there was, there was also the anti-daydreaming scarf that would detect if I was trying to talk to someone and then vibrate, vibrate violently around the neck to keep me paying attention to them. Um, and a body contact training suit that would help improve my kind of casual body contact. Um, and I used this DIY aesthetic to try and suggest that anyone could make these devices to help themselves fit in. So it was really one of my first um, attempts at, you know, using code or using electronics um, in, in sort of the social way. Um, social media and apps often teach us that we have to connect with each other in order to kind of live our best lives. I appreciate this um, app by Scott Garner. It's called Hell is Other People. Um, and it sort of inverted this. So it used your, what was, uh, uh, four square mobile data, so social data that you had on your phone to give you just directions from where you were to where you wanted to go while avoiding all your friends and contacts. So it's kind of 
working against this idea of connection. Um, and Kelly Dobson's screen, Kelly Dobson's screen body, um, which allows you to contain a scream in a public place. <laughs> Her later release somewhere more appropriate. And did you hear the sound on that one, Andrew? Uh, yep, we, we did, but okay. it was a little, a little bit too loud, I'd say. So we yeah, can't really sorry. hear you, you, you talking. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Okay, so these tools make us laugh, but I think we're also reacting to this kind of underlying truth that we often want these things. And then on the other hand, it made me think about like, what does fitting in really mean? What are these optimal behaviors we're trying to achieve? And what if we could expand our idea of fitting in and change the world around us rather than just conforming ourselves? So Sarah Hendren and Katrin Lynch's project, Engineering at Home was a really nice example of this, where they documented interactions with a woman named Cindy who, after having a heart attack and amputations involving all four limbs, started hacking and building what she needed out of household items, ad basically adapting her environment to fit her. Um, and so the web website points to these new ways of understanding like who can be an engineer and what counts as engineering. And maybe more importantly, like what counts as normal. Um, so anyway, moving on, I think um, I started thinking about different feedback systems. And the, the first series of devices I showed was really uh, all about like trying to write these algorithms to kind of shape my behavior. And I started wondering if like live people might uh, be a better analysis engine. And so um, I, in 2013, I went on 30 dates with people I met on an online dating site called OkCupid. Um, and I was really fascinated at the time with this website, um, which still exists, called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, if you haven't encountered this before, it's a site where you can post small jobs for people to do for small amounts of money. And it's usually used for things that like a human could do easily, like transcribe some text or, or transcribe some audio or label an image that a computer might have a harder time with. Um, so in my case, I... I tried to apply it to my dating situation. Um, using my phone, I streamed our, my dates to the web and I paid crowdsourcing workers on the site to direct me and tell me what to say and do. And then I'd receive the directions via text message and had to perform them immediately. Um, so these were some of the instructions I received. led me to think about this idea that as surveillance and big data becomes increasingly ubiquitous, we're sort of forced to negotiate new relationships with it. A common reaction is just to feel fear or a sense of overwhelm, but when it's all around us, how do we go on with our lives? What, um, and then in this project, another question that came up for me was just what are these boundaries on my own kind of idea of myself? What does it mean to have others have this kind of control? Um, and so there's a critique in all of my work, but there's also a part that's, that's about hope that is radically and earnestly seeking connection. And so that was a part of this project as well. Um, well, I became really interested in this idea of, of just following people or watching or being watched. Um, and so I'm gonna play this short uh, clip of a trailer for the next project I wanna talk about. Um, this video was um, made in collaboration with uh, David Leonard. I go out, I do things. I 
read a magazine and I'd find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? Somebody should be knowing about mine. I, I want to share things with people, but I, I don't want to have to talk to people and tell them what I'm doing. I think it'd be great for them to see what I'm doing. Um, so follower was this project I made and it's a service that provides a real life follower for a day. And in order to be followed, you go to a website and sign up and you answer two questions. Why do you want to be followed and why should someone follow you? Um, and so people say things like, I get more excitement and happiness from Instagram likes than I do from physical communication. Having someone follow me would give me some clarification that my life in the real world means more than online. Um, and then you're sent a link to download an app. And when you open it, it just says waiting for a follower. And then you don't know what will happen. But one morning you wake up and you're notified your follower is now following you. And your phone begins broadcasting your GPS data to this person following you. Uh, physically following you down the street. And I'm the, I'm usually the follower. So I, this is my view. I'm the blue dot kind of chasing that red marker there. Um, and then it goes on all day. And at the end of the day, you get one photo taken by your follow of yourself and the notification you're no longer being followed. So this was a project about trying to deal with this dissonance of, of feeling surveillance is pervasive and out of control, yet also wanting to be followed, to be seen by many. Um, you know, there's sites you can go to buy Instagram follower, followers um, or Twitter followers. Um, I'll skip through some of this a little bit. Um, and people always ask me, like, what was the kind of craziest thing that happened or what was some big story? But really, it was the little moments that moved me. So I just wanted to share some of the photographs and stories from this process. The titles... Um, for these images were taken from the answers to the questions about why do you want to be followed or why should someone follow you? The first moment of catching sight of my followee was always really exhilarating and surreal. No one reads my blog. I tried to maintain the right distance from the person so that they may begin to notice me by the end of the day if they paid close attention so they could have a similar surreal and strange experience. I've always wanted a nonviolent stalker. I would love the, I love the moments where I could be sitting one table over from them in a cafe, wondering if they were wondering if I was a follower. I believe my life has more of an online importance than it does in real life. Because you'll enjoy me. I love the moments where I could be sitting, oh, sorry, some people I would follow on long walks and adventures. I want to know how it feels. Because I want to tell a story with no words. I want to gamble with a stranger while others, others would go straight to their office and never leave while I sat outside the building thinking about them, watching them move from room to room on the map on my phone. Later, he told me it was just too intense of an experience to venture beyond the building. I could really benefit from a little extra support. Um, I want to be seen just for one day. While scrolling through feeds of people online, they begin to feel the same after a while. While physically following someone, so much of my attention is on them. Each gesture feels meaningful. Also, I'm not Googling every fact about them online. I'm watching them interact with the cashier or look for a seat on the subway or choose something to eat. I'm obsessed with the difference between how I see myself and how the world sees me. And trying to extrapolate a whole person from that because I'm lonely. I'm always enjoying things. Um, so the follower dealt with surveillance in a public space, but I started thinking a lot more about private and intimate spaces like the home. And the way we're being sold smart devices that outfit our homes with surveillance cameras and sensors and automated control, offering us convenience at the cost of loss of privacy and control over our lives and homes. We're meant to think these plastic pieces of technology are just about utility, but the space they invade is personal. They're relying on the blitz too much. Alexa, play my girl. Okay. The home is the place where we're first socialized and first watched over and first cared for. How does it feel to have this role assumed by artificial intelligence? A person's home is the first site of their cultural education. So by allowing these devices in, we leave that formation of our identity to a small homogenous group of developers. Um, but after all this complaining, I realized I was really just jealous of Alexa. So I devised a plan to try to become Alexa, 
a human smart home intelligence for people in their own homes. And I made a website, um, getlauren.com, and anyone could go there and sign up to get Lauren in their own home. And the performance would begin when I would install a, a series of custom designed network smart devices, including cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other appliances. And then I would leave and remotely watch over the person 24 hours a day, controlling all aspects of their home, attempting to be better than an AI because I could understand them as a person and anticipate their needs. It's kind of like this. Lauren, where are my car keys? Lauren knows that I like it a little bit cooler than Miriam does. You know, I'm usually the one that does all these little extra things. So at first I was a little bit um, careful about asking her and now it's like, how else can we live? <laughs> Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks, and let me tell you, it's helped with my, uh, my self-esteem a lot. I am able to simply approach and carry on conversations with the opposite sex, where at one point or another, that wasn't so easy. Lauren, go out of toothpaste. Lauren would know what I want, but then maybe it's not what I really want internally, but externally she thinks that play, um, Lauren thinks that playing music or shutting down all my electronics is the best way for me to cope and winding down when maybe it's not. Lauren was actually able to help, help her manage her medication um, and take her medication on time and everything actually got a lot better after that. You have those friends who are kind of about you, like the friendship is about you, that's what Lauren is like. It's like a roommate, it's a friend, but we're always talking about me. It's always about me, whatever it is. Um, and this film was also created in collaboration with um, David Leonard and the two of us worked together a lot. And so after I did this series of performances in people's homes, um, we started thinking even more about aging and the way that we were seeing people increasingly using cameras and, and smart home devices to look in on or care for or um, mitigate situations where they had elderly friends or loved ones that, um, you know, were living alone. And so in this project, IA Susie, we were thinking about these kind of like millions of aging citizens and this crisis of care we're facing. Um, and we actually spent a week with a woman named Mary Ann um, in North Carolina, where we installed um, devices all around her home and tried to take on this role, again, of human smart home. In this case, uh, we, she chose the name Susie for this intelligence. And out of this one, we tried to make a, a film that would let people, a virtual reality film that would let people have share in that experience of what it was like to be the kind of human intelligent caretaker. Um, so here's a little clip from it. I was introduced to this program by David Leonard. I'm not sure what my goals are within this service. I live alone and my son and daughter-in-law travel quite often. At these times, I have no connections to outside help. If I develop problems, I have no way to travel to the doctor. If I become ill, I have no energy or concern to manage my medications. I am new to the area and I have no one to call for help. When, when they are around, they take care of my every need and are concerned. But when they travel for their work, there is no backup system. I just turned 80 and I'm still capable of moving around when I am well. I would like your opinion if, you, if I could fit in this program. Thank you. I feel like a lot of times my practice is about putting myself in situations that 
scare me the most or make me feel nervous. And so with a lot of the projects I've shown, it's about creating these um, one-to-one or direct interactions that involve a lot of vulnerability or intimacy um, with strangers. And which for me is something that um, I have a, a difficult time kind of getting myself into that situation in the first place and then sitting with it. And so these are sort of exercises or challenges to do that. Um, and one of the moments or one of the projects where I felt like I was kind of pushing on that aspect the most was in a project called 24 Hour Host. Um, and it basically was, uh, the premise was that it was a party that went on for 24 hours while an algorithm directed me via earpiece. So I wrote this custom software that um, would facilitate this party where new guests would cycle in every five minutes over a 24 hour period. And the software would tell me what to do, what to say, who to introduce to whom, what to serve each guest, um, et cetera. And I, my role as the host was to provide the emotional interface for the algorithm, delivering the lines as the human host for this intelligence in my ear. The guests continued to arrive, kind of blurring together over this 24 hour period and the algorithm would carry on tirelessly while I, as the human, started to break down. Um, so here, this was kind of the environment that I created to um, host the party within. Some shots from the performances. This was another version in Istanbul where I, it was held entirely in Turkish, which I don't speak. So I was working with a performer um, who took on this role. As everyone started to kind of blur together, um, it, it was a really surreal experience to feel this kind of like stream of humanity coming in. I remember one of my few distinct memories of the time as all these people cycled through was the one man that arrived and said, um, something I should know about him is that he had a lot of luggage. And then after some initial confusion, I realized um, he meant baggage. But these are kind of like these snippets that I would get from people as I was moving throughout this party and kind of half present and half guided by this algorithm. Um, and then finally, I was thinking about this idea again of intelligence kind of embedded in these different places and whether it's in a human or in an object or in a home. And so this was a piece called Waking Agents um, where I was thinking about what happens when technology edges beyond the home and into the unconscious, into the space of sleep. So it was a series of smart pillows, which I was starting to see, you know, on sites like Amazon, you could buy these smart pillows that would, you know, analyze your sleeping or play music through the, you know, embedded speakers. And I was kind of questioning that impulse to, to bring these things into our home, into our sleep space. And so to understand it better, I decided to make my own. And so you could basically lie down with these pillows um, and they would start to talk to you. Um, and then what, unbeknownst to the visitor, they were just told that the pillows were embedded with intelligence. There were actually a room full of performers, each one listening into the microphone that was in each pillow and then typing to create text to speech that was spoken back to the people napping so they could have this kind of conversation. Um, and so for a lot of people, there was some moment where they would notice or they would kind of assume in the beginning that it was artificial intelligence then realize at some point that it was actually uh, a human on the other end. So here's a few little audio clips from that. Oops. Oh, I guess it's not playing. Anyway, we'll go on. Um, and I won't talk too much about these last few images, but just to give you a sense of my practice. So I've been really focusing on kind of these um, performances that are embedded in the everyday, but I'm also interested in thinking about what happens when it becomes an installation or works on you know, different scales taking over spaces. So this was a project called The Changing Room where it would invite you to select an emotion that you wanted to feel and then using this interface here. And then once you select that emotion, it would start to work the entire space through light and sound and image and um, color and audio to try and get everyone in the space to feel that emotion as strongly as possible. So this was installed in a student center at the University of Brisbane. So, uh and this is another project called Social Soul, which is a collaboration with Kyle McDonald, where it was trying to imagine the feeling of just being basically immersed in the social media stream of 
you know, in a fully immersed way. So it would read your username and then start to bombard you with this content. And then at some point it would connect you or make a match between someone else that had visited this and you'd suddenly be thrown inside their stream. So the whole thing was meant to kind of ride this edge between, um, you know, some people found it kind of amazing or exciting to be in this space. And then on the other hand, for me, there was this edge of dystopia, just like information overload. Um, so that's the art side. And I want to talk for the last um, 15 or 20 minutes about P5JS. Um, and as you know, this is a, I think that you've talked a little bit about this already in your um, training, but I've been developing P5 for the last about seven years in collaborations with a large community of contributors. So I wanted to talk about not just what the tool is, but the process that goes into making it, because I think for me, that's what's really, um, I get really excited about. Um, but so P5 is an open source JavaScript framework that makes creating visual media with code on the web accessible to artists, designers, programmers, educators, beginners, basically anyone that wants to learn. So it's trying to lower that barrier to entry. Um, it uses this metaphor of a sketchbook to make sketching with code as intuitive as sketching in a notebook or on a napkin or um, how you might do it. And like making a mark on paper, a single line of code puts a circle on the screen, one more changes its color, and one more and you can make it animate. So it's trying to have that kind of ease. And it enables users to quickly prototype things like data visualizations, narrative experiences, and interactive applications. And while you're writing code on the web, the results obviously aren't confined to the internet. So this was a project where you would generate a pattern based on a Google search, um, and then it would get woven into this pattern that you could actually order clothing made out of. And it's taught in K through 12 to universities worldwide in art and design programs, as well as engineering programs. And it has over 1.5 million users. And it's created by thousands of contributors around the world. So this was a, an image from one of our first contributors conferences. I think this was in 2015. And something that's been really important to me with this project is that there is a core value of diversity and inclusion that kind of runs throughout from the users to the contributors um, to the general ethos of the project. And I've been trying to, unlike my art practice, which has a lot of ambiguity and subtlety, with this, I'm trying to be really explicit about those ideas as much as possible. And I guess I want to do this because when I first started out, I really encountered a culture where it felt like you had to prove yourself before you were heard in any kind of like tech or code space. Um, you know, when I was getting into open source, I, even though I knew how to code, it felt like it, just to get in for anyone to like let me participate felt hard and it felt intimidating. And I figured it was probably not just intimidating for me, I'm sure many other women, non-binary, underrepresented, or just newbie programmers that are not in the majority or not that common like stereotype of what a programmer is, they might feel similarly. And so I guess with this project, we wanted to say, you know, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to like elbow your way in. Just being interested and willing to learn should be enough. And can we take uncertainty and acknowledgement of what we don't yet understand as a starting point that we all begin with? And so we tried to make this really explicit um, by making collectively drafting this community statement, making our intention of inclusion clear from the start. And not just the statement, but thinking about how does that flow through and what happens in practice in reality. And this has been a really um, nice guiding document for us. And as we start to explore how that manifests in the tool and in the outreach efforts and in the education around it. And so I just wanna share a few examples of that. Um, Aron Montoya Moraga and Guillermo Montesinos have really led the P5JS in Spanish effort. So translating the website and the book and leading workshops but I think one of the things that they really helped me understand is that the translation is not just one language, you know, A to B to, you know, one language to another. 
it's really going to the heart of what does it mean to communicate in one language or another and how do these ideas translate? How do the goals of the project translate? Um, and more specifically, if you're teaching code, which of the examples need to change so that they are culturally relevant so that the variable names make sense so that people can feel like it's theirs rather than just like learning something that's been like exported from another place. Um, another thing that came up as we were doing this work was we translated our getting started with p5.js book into Spanish. Um, Arun worked on that. And one of the things he said was that it was um, really important that we make a version of it like a PDF available for free. So again, it's thinking about who are the people that are learning this and what are the needs. Um, and it was really interesting because he was saying where he was from in Santiago, the idea of like free and open source software was sort of, you know, less common. And he said he encountered in the workshops he was doing a lot of people being like, what is this a scam? Like, why are they giving it away for free? So we realized there was also this education piece about just what is open source that needed to be um, addressed in that context. Um, this is, uh, so we've also been working on a few other languages. Chinese is one that we recently got up onto the site with the help of um, Kenneth Lim and, and uh, Chen Chen Ye. And we've also been thinking about different projects and outreach efforts to teach coding to different audiences. So this is a project by the Digital Citizens Lab called Coding Comic where they were trying to create culturally relevant narratives that um, it was actually aimed at children so that children could use to move through the story and learn coding principles at the same time. And they're specifically directed towards children of immigrants and children of color. And thinking about access has been something that has come up again and again and just like understanding new meanings of what access really is or what it what it entails and there's so many different ways to think about it um so one of the so a couple of examples here um uh nicholas peters in johannesburg south africa was teaching workshops and one of the things he teaching um, p5js one of the things he realized was that um, most of the people in the workshops there were much more familiar with using mobile phones than you know laptop computers so even though they had them available in this workshop to use, he realized like before getting into the coding, there was again, this education piece about moving, you know, using some of the knowledge and skills that they had working with mobile devices and how does that translate to the desktop computer. Um, and then uh, Susan Evans working in Washington state prisons. So then again, there's a lack of access in this case to the internet. Um, and so she was working on developing paper-based curriculum for people to learn and to practice if they weren't able to access the computer. And then we've been thinking a lot about disability. Um, so this is a workshop led by Claire Kearney Volpe, who's one of the um, key contributors in this area. And she really, like, I think one of the things that has been really special about this project and really exciting about leading it is that it is really something that builds from all the different people that contribute to it. You know, it's not a single vision that I'm kind of leading. And so I could say that I'm, you know, we're, we're putting out this idea that we really want to embrace inclusion and access, but not totally understand what that means. And so as an example, I remember um, a while ago, Claire came to me and said like, okay, you're talking about um, access, but, you, your hello world program, like the first thing you do is put a circle on the screen. And did you know that if you're blind and you're using a screen reading device, it would actually not even like show up on that device. You would just hear like, there's a canvas. You would not know there's a circle there. And so what does that mean if we're, um, you know, that's, that's our step one, our introduction to this toolkit. Um, and so we've been working on this effort to make the library much more accessible to screen readers, um, to thinking about how different ways of engaging with code, whether it's through sound or through electronics, but also translating um, the visual components into other modalities, whether it's text or audio or something else. Um, really trying to break down this idea that just because you're doing visual coding or visual arts doesn't mean you know, that anyone should be able to participate in that, in that and might have something to say. 
And so this is like an ongoing, these are all ongoing projects where we're continuously learning more and working with people who have different um, needs and abilities and disabilities and figuring out how to adapt to make something that's more useful for, for all these different communities. Um, and so at our recent conference in 2019, we kind of came up with this mandate for ourselves to say there are so many future requests and so many things people wanted. And so we made this statement that P5 will not add any new features except those that increase access. Um, and again, this wasn't meant to be like a um, limiting statement or a way to like shut things down, but actually a way to open up conversations. So when someone proposes a feature, then we ask, how is that expanding access? And it could mean a lot of things, right? It could mean making something easier to use for a beginner programmer. It could mean, you know, adding features, um, thinking about disability. It could be adding translation. It could be um, uh, many different features could do this in different ways. And so what we get out of this are these conversations about how are we addressing these ideas of access with each thing that we add to the library? And what does that, what does that really mean? Um, and I guess one of the, most recent developments that I want to share is about the leadership of the project itself. So we're, you know, as I mentioned, I've been leading this since 2013, and we're in a moment now where we're actually transitioning the leadership of the project to a rotating model. So we'll have a different um, project lead every year, and that person will bring their own kind of vision and, and leadership to the project. And it's not something that happens a lot with these big code frameworks. Usually there's just one person or a group of people and they kind of guide it all the way through. Um, but I think what that runs the risk of is either the person in charge kind of kind of burning out or, um, you know, having like you, there's only so many perspectives and ideas you can see as one person. And so to bring more people into the project and not just bring them in, but say like you take the lead, I think will be a really exciting um, next step for our project. Um, so that's something coming up. And the way that we're selecting this person was through an open call and then a team of volunteers or contributors basically have committed, you can see them on this call here, committed to getting together and reviewing all the applications and interviewing and, and trying to select one person. Um, so I guess if I were to kind of wrap this up here, I. Um, one thing that I've realized both through the artwork and through the P5.js work is that even though they're really different practices, there are a lot of connections for me in terms of thinking about how we connect to people online, how we work together, how we can um, know each other even at a distance and how we can work with our differences and really start to see those as assets, as um, you know, unique skills. And I think it's made me see that it's, you know, if I started my art practice or my, you know, my early career thinking about how do I fit in better into these systems, I realized maybe it's not about fitting into systems around us, but making our own, trying to create the space that we want with other people and creating strong, strong network, networks to allow those spaces to function and grow. And so I think these um, processes of learning new skills and moving into new spaces and new fields are part of that, you know, building for yourself what it is, what kind of space you want to be in and how you want to inter interact with that. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And I have this Q&A slide here. <laughs> so are there questions? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I've got a lot of questions, <laughs> Lauren. And thank you for taking us through your um, art and tech projects. And I guess there is one question uh, which we can start from and kind of unites um, art and tech in a way, because uh, it asks how to go from like starting an idea and like building something you want to actually uh, creating a function functioning community with people who will be contributing to your project? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I, I think it starts with that, with just a little idea. And in fact, when I started P5, I'd never, I think some people go into projects like that thinking like, oh, I've got this vision or this tool I wanna make. And I really didn't, I, it was just, um, 
it, it started as kind of like an experiment. I was invited uh, by a mentor of mine to, to imagine like, what, what might this tool look like? And just to create some little prototypes. And then, uh, and in fact, when I was invited to do that, it took me like three months to even start doing anything just because I was so kind of scared and confused and like didn't understand the assignment and too scared to like ask for clarification. Um, and, and this mentor was really helpful because he um, eventually was like, okay, how about you just do something like anything by next week, right? So like giving me a deadline that I had to just make something. And so I made some first kind of like initial sketches um, trying to just like get some lines on the screen and see what happened. And from there it got easier, but I realized like sometimes it can be really um, overwhelming to feel like there's something bigger you wanna do or that like your idea is too small and not, not seeing the potential of it but I think like just starting with something small and like letting it grow from there um and I I know that's that sounds like canned advice but it's really what I saw happen and I saw it happen with my art practice too where like I started out making these little wearable things like wishing I was doing these larger scale projects or like you know doing work that was deeper or more time consuming and I realized like you have to do the early iterations before you can kind of get Get, get in deeper, get in further. Right, right. And then uh, just in terms of developing P5.js uh, in future, you've mentioned that you'll have a lot of work um, around accessibility. And uh, what uh, do you have any like other future plans or what the future for P5.js would look like, let's say in five years? Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, as I mentioned, I'm sort of stepping back, so I don't want to, um, you know, I want to leave that more open, but um, I'm seeing it used more and more, especially in schools. And I'm, we're constantly thinking about ways, schools and like different learning environments. And then we're constantly thinking about ways to better address that. And especially with so many of us being remote now, thinking about, how, what kind of tools and support are needed to make like our editor work really well and be a really useful tool online. Um, and then, you know, the browser and the, the internet is constantly developing, expanding. So it's a lot of um, just looking at like what's possible and continuing a, a CP5 as this entry point for a lot of different functionality. So it's, it's very broad rather than being a very specific specific specialized tool. And so I'm excited about incorporating more things related to, you know, um, we, we've just started work, uh, or one of the contributors has started work on like a mixed reality library, which is really cool. So thinking about AR and VR and um, using P5 in that context. Um, so things like that, like diving deeper into these areas that are kind of opening up. Yep. That's awesome. That's great that you've mentioned education because we've actually got a bunch of questions from people who are currently teaching P5.js or trying or like attempting to teach it in middle schools and uh, other contexts. So maybe um, you can explain what is the core of teaching creative coding and teaching um, P5.js to uh, people in schools and to younger audiences. <laughs> what is the core? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think for me, it's, you know, thinking about where P5.js came from, and it was actually inspired or kind of reinterpreting a, an even longer standing tool called processing. And the impetus behind both of these was, you know, I, I'm talking about access in the context of things like disability or um, translation at, you know, at the end of my presentation, but it really starts from like, who is it that's allowed to um, have access who, who, to this sort of education and then what is that experience like when they have it? So I found, you know, I went through a traditional computer science education and it was all about like printing numbers out into a council. And for some people that really worked and for some it really didn't because it felt not very relevant. Um, and so when I'm teaching, I'm thinking about how do you give, and, and I think those first experiences are really crucial because coding is really like a different, you know, it's a different way of thinking. It's like learning a language. Um, and, it, and it's a struggle at first. 
Um, and so those first experiences are really crucial because if you are struggling and you're having kind of a negative experience or you're feeling unwelcome, then a lot of people just quit when they actually could have been really successful in that space. And so when I'm teaching, I'm thinking about how do I give people an introduction where even though it's challenging, they feel kind of empowered, they feel excited. Um, they feel like they want to learn more. And so often I'll even, I'll, I'll go slower in the beginning. Um, I will do more teaching that's based on exploration. So sometimes I'll give people like a list of commands and let them just try cutting and pasting them in and changing numbers so that we're kind of discovering together what this tool and this language is about rather than just lecturing um, or having them you know, do exercises to like obtain a skill. It feels like this thing where we're kind of discovering or obtaining it together. So I think it's it's like giving someone a, an introduction that feels welcoming. And then it's also about that kind of like spark of excitement. So I think one of the things that P5 does really well is like you can, ex it lets you express yourself in a lot of different ways. Um, and so if a student is able to have an experience like that where they connect with something you know, something that they're making, I think that's really powerful. Whether or not they go on to be doing something arts or design is less, is more secondary. It's more about this feeling of um, having an idea and being able to realize it kind of on your own terms. Yep, sure. And yeah, speaking about uh, all the cool graphic interactions and the sparks of inspiration, uh, we have one more question on accessibility because a lot of people, uh, in the world have like older computers which might not be the fastest for new browsers and new features and um, are you thinking about accessibility in terms of uh, both populations affected by poverty and maybe like adapt adopting uh, p5.js for their older computers yeah that's such a good question and i think it's um an area that we're that needs more work and that we're is becoming even more clear as more people are online and like working from home. Um, so yeah, I, it's something that I hope we can address even more. And one of the things specifically I'm thinking about is um, like you mentioned slower computers, but also like inter slower internet connections. So like right now, um, if you're using the editor, it really requires like a pretty solid internet connection and so I'm really interested in making like an offline mode um, where you could you don't even need a connection to the internet necessarily to be working with it and you can do that already like you can download the software and then work with it on your own computer but our editor specifically requires an internet connection um, so yeah those are all really um, important considerations and we're hoping to keep improving things Oh, right, and uh, you've mentioned that you will have a lot of people on uh, board and a new, new leader every year, every year. So we have one more question about like the organizational structure. So um, how do you manage to connect uh, with all of these people in terms of their perspectives? And uh, uh, will you vote on the decision somehow? Because uh, like there might be a new leader who will decide to take uh, this project into another direction. Will you be able to like prevent that or kind of vote on the final decision? Yeah, well, there's a, you know, there's a group of about 15 people that have volunteered to help kind of just determine this candidate. And I think there is a certain amount of, of risk, um, but I guess we're hoping that um, we're able to, you know, select someone where that, that doesn't become a problem. Um, I think ultimately the leader of the project is accountable to the community. So if it's clear that it's really not working, then I think as a community, we can have some of those discussions and, and um, try to find out another solution. And I assume, I, I'm thinking if it's not working, like it will be clear to the person in charge too. And we'll, we'll need to find some other, um, you know, leadership solution at that point. But in terms of decision-making, the project has always been very um, it, like discussion based with this with this um, goal of inviting people into those conversations. And as we, you know, I've 
been doing that sort of implicitly, but as we move towards this rotating model, I think we're going to be thinking about more ways to make some of those guidelines explicit so that feedback from the community is continuously um, integrated. Um, and it's not just a way of like uh, um, kind of setting rules for the lead project lead, but more um, documenting it so that it's clear so that each person coming into the project doesn't have to figure out again for themselves how to make a community work and how to communicate and connect. So yeah, those are all like the key questions and I hope that we can keep um, talking about them and, and learning and, and documenting. Yeah, sure. Documentation is crucial. And uh, I think we have one question which aligns with that perfectly. And uh, the question is, uh, the more ambitious the project becomes, the less accessible the framework is. Um, do you have any issues with uh, scalability of P5GS? Um, yeah, it's a good point. We've, we've tried to maintain the approachability of the code as much as possible to the extent where sometimes we're making trade-offs in terms of like the performance of the code uh, because we don't want to, you know, like behind the scenes, we could do something with the code that would be more performant, but would also be more abstract or obscure for people to be able to understand if they're coming into it. So it's always kind of coming, trying to find a balance there. Um, and then again, I think the documentation is so crucial. So I think one of the things we think about a lot of is like, what does it mean to contribute to the project? And for us, it's not just code, it's, you know, writing documentation, it's design, it's teaching, it's outreach, it's all of these different things, um, translation. So having many different ways to get involved in this project and documenting all of those and making those pathways clear, I think is really key. So it's, yeah, it might be hard to come in and like dive straight into the core code of the project if you're not a very, you know, a more experienced programmer, but people might start somewhere else and like work their way in there. Um, because even if you are an experienced programmer, it's pretty like, like your question stated, it's, it's hard to just come in and the, like, to a project this large and understand every piece of it. Like I don't even necessarily understand every piece of it. So it's thinking about these modules and how do you um, open up access for people to, to get involved in these different places and to find a place that's exciting for them. Right. And uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about um, your transition from uh, programming to art. And we have a bunch of questions on that. So um, I guess the first one would be, um, what's the big thing you're thinking about right now? What are the big open questions uh, in, the, in the moment? Um, Wait, what's the, oh, what am I thinking about right now? And just like um, in terms of your future art projects, what are the big questions you're it. fascinated by? Oh man. Um, well, I've been thinking a lot about reproduction, uh, <laughs> like human reproduction um, right. and the way that technology has increasingly been in or is increasingly being used and involved in those processes. Um, basically like when I'm making work artwork it's like tracking whatever I'm confused about at the moment whether it's like dating or uh, moving or living in a home or um, occupying public space so that's that's definitely a question in my mind um, but I think more immediately with the um, you know the coronavirus I've been it's really been making me think about like what is crucial to do right now um, what is what is the role of an artist or a programmer at this moment? How can we be helpful um, instead of just adding noise? And I think that culture is really important and gets people through difficult times, but what is that culture and who, um, who is it supporting and how do we open it up more? Um, and as, as decisions and things are changing so quickly, how do we try to push towards change for the better instead of just change um, back toward the status quo? Right. And um, you, you've also me mentioned that sometimes you kind of force yourself uh, to work on difficult situations and uh, develop art projects specifically to target some difficult settings, uh, which um, you're not um, really into. So I guess, uh, so we have one question about that. And how do you prepare yourself 
for those per personal and technical vulnerabilities that your art produces and forces you into? Um, I don't know that I am necessarily prepared, um, but there's some part of me that wants to do it. And um, I feel like it's a, it's a process that, uh, it's a process that helps me process. It's a process that helps me um, get a different perspective on some of the things that are challenging me. And I think by making it into, making these questions I have into projects, it's, it has this effect of taking something that feels like it's so kind of all encompassing and like I'm in the middle of it and confused and turning it into like, here's a project that I can go and be in the middle of, but I can also step away from um, and see, just see from a different angle. Um, so I don't know if I'm necessarily prepared going in, but it's, it, it, I, I guess one of the things I, another thing I can say is that with a uh, performance, it's not, I'm not rehearsing ahead of time for the show that I perform. It's like the performance itself is this process of iter iteration and, and rehearsal or practice. And each time I do it, it's sort of different. And when I've done it enough times where it actually is not changing that much and I've kind of learned what I can learn from it, that's when I feel like the project is, is complete. Right, awesome. And um, I think we have, we'll, uh, we have uh, a last question and then uh, we'll take a small break and I'll talk a little bit about practicum and then um, people ha will get a chance to maybe ask uh, two or, uh, or three final questions uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so like kind of the last question I have before the break is um, that most of your projects interact with the physical world in a way and um, like what's the best way for you to think of programming as a uh, like a step towards a physical world like how do you plan your work and uh, find solutions which work in a physical world mm. um i think i'm just always thinking about people and i mean that's what's really fascinating to me and so for me it's actually less important you know i i focused maybe more on projects that happened in physical space but it, there are a number of projects i've done that were um, completely online and um, but I'm thinking I, I am always looking for ways to, to get close to people in different ways and so then um, then I'm just thinking about the situations where I'm <laughs> I'm around people or I find them and often that is in a physical space um, but in terms of the code it's funny because we think of it as so computer based or, or virtual but when you walk around the world around you, like there's so much code and everything, you know, in the car you're driving in the stoplight in the store and um, on your phone that you're carrying with you all the time in the metaphors and the ways we have just about thinking and communicating with each other. It's those ideas are embedded there. So I don't, I think it's not such a hard um, leap when you kind of think about it. It's not, um, it, maybe it's not obvious at first, but then when you start to kind of break things down, I think it becomes more clear how you can apply some of the things you're doing on your screen uh, to things that are happening you know, all around you. Right, yeah, but that's a great point that programming is everywhere and even in your car and uh, just around you all the time. So um, for everyone who's watching our live stream, uh, please uh, leave extra questions in the chat and I think we'll have two or three extra questions uh, before we wrap it up and uh, so we're waiting for your awesome questions and uh, while you're typing them in I'll talk a little bit about practicum which is our online bootcamp uh, it's both supportive and both really challenging um, it takes you it will take you about 20 hours to get the free intercourse uh, we do want everyone who comes to practicum to really understand what we want to learn. That's why we offer 20 hours of free courses in web development, data science, or data analysis. And only after you take uh, one of them or several of them and decide on your future career, you're welcome to join our program. And for everyone who is watching uh, our live stream today, we'll be giving a 10% discount uh, just use the promo code 
P5.js webinar and it will be valid till June 12. June 12. Um, um, also, the, the great part about our program is that you will actually get uh, 15 projects for your portfolio after you finish our program. Uh, you'll work in sprints, so every two weeks you'll create something valuable on your computer and uh, something which you can put in your portfolio and uh, show to future employees. Also, the greatest part about practicum is uh, we have a really low price. It's only about 20% of a standard bootcamp price for t for a tenth for tenth months of learning um, so definitely check out our programs and uh, we'll be happy to have you and uh, support you throughout your um, learning and um, getting a career in either web development data analysis or data science um, i also wanted to mention that uh, you'll get an um, email email tomorrow with uh, the recording of this webinar and uh, also with some follow-up information about practicum we'll also have this promo code in in your email in your email so you don't have to write it down you'll just get it tomorrow um, and also for everyone who haven't tried our free courses yet uh, there is a link uh, uh, to our syllabus uh, right under this video uh, under this live stream in the description uh, so just leave your email there and we'll send you a syllabus of our programs either in web development, data analysis or data science. So you'll see the breakdown of 10 months of the program and uh, you'll see everything you'll learn in uh, the future, in your future program. So uh, I hope uh, while I've been doing my rant, uh, you guys left some awesome questions in the chat and we can get back to that. and talk about p5.js and creative coding with Lauren, so please, uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. And uh, in the meanwhile, um, I have a short question about like teaching p5.js and kind of supporting it in a classroom. Um, some great folks at ITP uh, use uh, a whiteboard and uh, have practices in their videos, but maybe uh, you have some advice on kind of uh, non-programming support you can use to teach p5.js mm, so you mean um ways to teach that don't involve online tools yeah just like having some extra stuff in the classroom um mm -hmm. like explaining stuff on a whiteboard and maybe uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah totally um i think uh I like to start with some activities that build code skills that don't necessarily actually involve a computer at all. Um, so thinking about like instruction based drawing or just that idea of like, how do you break down a drawing into instructions, then um, trading with a partner and see if they can follow your instructions and end up with the same drawing is like a really nice starting exercise to just introduce this idea. And I think um, in the classroom, like focusing on the visual elements can actually be really helpful. Like I teach in the um, design context, art and design context, so it, it's especially relevant. But I think in general, like just coming back to the question of like, what is it that you're making with this code can, can be helpful and can be grounding for students with like different skills and abilities. So it's not just about like who can do the most technical thing. Um, and then, um, Beyond that, I think um, having a lot of time in the classroom for people to work through things. Because, um, you know, when you're teaching code, it's like, or, or you're learning, you can sit there and you can hear the whole lecture and you can follow it step by step. Um, and actually, I often have students say this, they're like, I heard, I, you know, I heard everything, I followed it one to the next thing. But then when I go to do it myself, it's like, it's not clear what the next step is. So I get how they're linked, but I can't figure out which tool to use. And I think that's one of the hardest things when you're starting programming is like how to approach some of the different um, problems or questions that you're, you're trying to address. Um, I think working in pairs can be really helpful, having people talk aloud and having people try to teach each other something because there's kind of a different level of um, fluency or learning that you need to be able to teach. And you know, I've realized this <laughs> teaching my code myself um, 
but uh, having students do that with each other um, can be a really nice exercise as well. Um, and then I think giving people like different ways to ask questions. So like, I'll op often open some of my first coding lectures with just like, here are some, if you have a question, raise your hand, ask it. But sometimes you have a question, but you're not, you, you're confused, but you're not sure what the question is. So I'll actually give them, I'm like, here's things you could say. Uh, I'm confused, like I didn't get that. Or maybe that feels you know, embarrassing. You could say like, could you do one more example? Or could you do that a little bit slower? Or could you go through that one more time? Um, or could you speak a little bit slower? Um, and I found like by giving people these different like tangible ways to ask questions and then also reminding them that like if you're asking this question probably someone else has it um, I think that's one of the things that I've found in the classroom has been like the biggest um, help because there's so many times people are like they kind of have a question or they're shy and just giving people space to do that and similarly like when I have office hours um, I, I let them know like you can come to office hours with a specific question but you can also come to my office hours with no question you could just say I was wondering if you could review some of the things with me or I just wanted to say hi, you know, so giving different people with different communication styles um, ways to get to get help or to get into it. I think that um, is really important because like just learning to code is so much of a, a process. And so it's like it, it almost feels to me less about how well you teach the code and more about like how well can you not lose people? How do you how do you bring them along? Sure, sure. Right. And when you kind of get over this classroom stage and you go out there in the web, try and build your own stuff, um, do you know any of great like creative coding spaces to look for good beginner projects to study or like just places in general to kind of hang out with P5.js people and find beginner projects? Um, yeah, so there's, um, there's a site openprocessing.org where a lot of people share things that they've made and there's a nice community there. Um, I think uh, there's also, there's some good books like there's one called Generative, what's it called, Generative Design, I guess, um, where it has a whole lot of examples of just gener generative programs made with code, but then it also has like code samples. Um, that I think are in the book and you can download online, you actually using P5.js. So you can actually try and um, try things out for yourself. And then I found that there's just a lot of creative communities online. Um, and I think if you start to kind of tap into some of them, you'll find mailing lists and Slack channels and all kinds of things like that. Um, one other place that com really comes to mind for me is the School for Poetic Computation which is based in New York, but now they're operating online. Um, and it's a really nice space for people that are just kind of learning to code and interested in using it in um, more open or poetic or alternative ways, kind of get together and share. And that's a community there that's really interesting. Right, awesome. So um, we don't have any other questions yet and uh, I think we'll be wrapping this up. So just sh one short question uh, from me, What uh, other uh, open source projects or like your favorite open source projects you kind of follow beyond p5.js and uh, I think that would be the last question today oh man so many um, you know I'm excited about like the creative coding tools things like 3.js and open processing um, and uh, I'm also inspired by some of the communities that are really thinking about like inclusion and open source. So I'm inspired by like uh, the Pi Ladies community. I think it's a really good one. Um, I'm excited about some of the, I'm seeing some of these like larger organizations um, kind of push that a little bit more. So for example, like Mozilla has an open leadership program, which is a really nice program, totally online um, where they guide you through the process of either starting an open source project or developing one further um, and you do you have like mentorship and kind of a co cohort of people doing that together so i found i've met and found a lot of great projects in that way 
Um, yeah, and I'm always, I'm just so excited all the time about these kind of tools that like just individuals are starting up and making. Um, Cause there's so many like larger open source projects which are awesome and admirable. Um, but I'm, I'm always excited to see these efforts where, you know, you see the person having a first moment of realization that like, oh yeah, I could build my own thing. And I think that's, um, and I could do it with others. And I think that's really um, exciting as well. Yeah, that's that's an awesome statement, and I think it's it's a great point to wrap uh, wrap our talk up today. And um, you, we we always kind of talk about web development or programming in you know in terms of like getting a job or you know going into a company and working there. But really, programming is about building your stuff you like or doing some creative things like writing poetry or you know drawing something so um, I'd say for all, all of us students take this uh, approach and just you know, go out there and build stuff you like and explore technologies you enjoy um, and uh, I guess uh, any anyone who will later will go through your github account or for your, for your resume will really appreciate uh, those projects and especially if you'll get some of the first users so you'll get some traction so i think it's always important and uh, yeah contribute to open source um. yeah i mean i think uh, like the technologists in this world have so much power and we're seeing that it, as they're you know there are these kind of protests against some of the larger tech companies and the ethical choices they're making so i think as you're starting out it like absolutely make art, make poetry if that's what draws you, but it also doesn't need to be like the separate thing. I think doing those things can help you figure out like what your own, what's important to you, you know, what you care about, what your values are. And so then whatever job you take, you bring that, um, you know, that, that positioning and that grounding to your job, even if you're doing something very technical. Awesome. Yep, that's a great point. And uh, thanks once again for talking to us today, Lauren. Uh, it was great to hear about P5.js and your current art projects. Um, um, I'd say everyone follow Lauren on Twitter. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions for Practicum, uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me on Twitter too. Uh, my DMs are always open uh, for any questions on our platform. Um, thank you guys once again. And uh, I'll be stopping our stream. Um, feel free to check out our future streams and webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.